Hey guys, this is John Blau with the Post and Courier uh, here for our weekly countdown to kickoff feature. Um, I guess this week is Gene Savikoff, uh, sports editor and columnist at the Post and Courier. Um, we're here to kind of talk about uh, last weekend's game against NC State, which was kind of a downer for Clemson, as well as kind of look ahead to this week's game with Boston College, which is kind of a really big deal, try to bounce back from uh, that kind of uh, miserable um, and a depressing showing in, in uh, Raleigh. So um, uh, first of all, just to mention a couple of things, if you got a question, uh, you can put that in the, the chat feature. Um, we can maybe answer that for you here live. Uh, this, this will also be uh, reproduced kind of in podcast form later so people can listen to it. Um, also, just to kind of promote our newsletter, which you can uh, get during the week, it's called the Tiger Take. Basically, my stories, you put those into a uh, newsletter with some other anecdotes and, and facts and breaking news and other types of things uh, that kind of keep you up to date on everything going on in Clemson. Uh, you can subscribe to that by going to thepostandcourier.com uh, forward slash the tiger take. Um, so now I'll turn to Gene and, and just ask Gene, uh, you were watching that game, I guess, in Raleigh. Um, what are your impressions? I mean, I guess, uh, obviously, uh, some things that are not going quite right for Clemson, but what would be the big takeaways you take away from that? John, uh, thanks for having me on the program. Um, I, I think that uh, you never know what you're going to get in a textile bowl up in Raleigh. Uh, but uh, I'd like to dwell on the positive a little bit. I'm going to spin this positive a little. The defense, wow, are they playing well. Some So many young players have come through this season. Uh, Will Shipley, I think he's averaging 4.8 yards a carry and has scored five touchdowns. Not bad for a freshman mm -hmm. against the kind of competition Clemson's played, which obviously includes Georgia and NC State. Um, and then the pass protection. You know, everybody knows that they gave up seven sacks against the Bulldogs in that opener. But since then, the sack allowance total for each game has gone zero against SC State, zero against Georgia Tech, two against NC State state so that's getting better i think part of it is dj uyunglele knowing when to get rid of the ball and not not taking a necessary sack and hey how about that recruiting um clemson's still uh doing well on the trail and uh maybe the big prize isn't even in the class of 2022 it's the class of 2023 as at some point uh probably before Clemson kicks off the 2022 season, Arch Manning will decide where he's going to go to school and maybe it'll be Clemson. Maybe it'll be Georgia. So uh, that's a spin on the future for me on the uh, NC state game. So many people just bashing the tigers and bashing Tony Elliott, the offensive coordinator that uh, I think some, a little bit of perspective is in order. And I know as we go on in the show here, there'll be plenty of bashing of the tigers. So. Yeah, you sound a lot like Dabo in his press conferences for the last, you know, week or two, just kind of really trying to hammer home the point that um, I think the, the stuff he was talking about this week is that people forget we've had adversity around here. And he likes to bring up, you know, 2009 and, and you know, 2010 and 2014, they started one and two and they, you know, obviously made a run and then had the run they had from 2015 up until now in, in, in the uh, college football playoff. Um, some of that uh, feels like, you know, trying to diffuse the situation and frustration and then, you know, just trying to spin it a little bit. But at the same time, though, yeah, there are a lot of, you know, valid points in what he's saying and, and that, you know, these are still, you know, actual, you know, human beings that have to be taught the game and, and kind of raised and matured and, and uh, figure out what they're doing in the spotlight. You know, the programs like Alabama every year just reload. And I think everybody wants to think that Clemson is up in that, you know, realm. And uh, it's kind of hard to see them take a step back for a second, but I mean, is it kind of unrealistic? Did we come into the season with unrealistic expectations for Clemson? Would you say Gene? Yeah. And there's uh, some different reasons for that. There is, you know, you can get really deep into the, into the woods and see why, but th there's, there's a couple of things. One, obviously they're replacing one of the greatest quarterbacks, not just at Clemson or in ACC history, but in the last 20 years or so in college football, Trevor Lawrence. And at the same time, replacing a two-time ACC player of the year, 
in Travis Etienne at running back, who just by that back-to-back -back ACC player of the year running back, you could argue is the best running back in ACC history. Um, it's, it's kind of a complex argument there, but you certainly could make the case and probably win the argument in most cases. And by the way, uh, Amari Rogers was a heck of a slot receiver in a sort of line of really good slot receivers, including Hunter Renfro and going back even to Adam Humphreys, um, all three guys in the NFL. I don't know that we've seen a slot receiver do much of anything at Clemson this year and certainly not of NFL caliber. But again, um, one of the reasons we thought that Clemson was going to be good is that the coaches, starting with Dabo, were singing the praises of various position units. And in my experience of covering Clemson football, and I, I've been there, you know, a long time, but let's just, for, for, the, for the sake of this discussion, it just really matters the Dabo Sweeney era. He's pretty level-headed when it comes to players. Obviously, he sings the praises of guys and loves his players and will tend to exaggerate, for instance, saying Kyle Parker was going to be like a really good NFL quarterback when Kyle Parker was playing. And we all at the time kind of scratched our heads. But I mean, he was talking up this offensive line, talking up this wide receiver group, Shipley, Uyunglele, et cetera. And I think we had the right to expect more. And, and as far as the criticism, if anybody within the program, John, is bristling about this, we, the media, we, the fans, I'm not a fan of, of you know, Clemson football in particular. I like college football, but we, the media, did not invent the term best is the standard. And when he brings up, John, you know, 2009, 2010, 2014, that's fine I start with Clemson with the college football playoff era, which did start in 2014, but for Clemson, it started in 2015, six straight college football playoff appearances. Did I expect Clemson to reach the playoff every year there's ever a playoff, especially at four with four teams? No, but I certainly expected them to be in the top 25 and they're at 25 right now, John, and I don't see why they are. I don't see what they've done to, to deserve to be in the top 25. Right. Other than probably their history and, and what everybody expects Clemson to be. And they're, they're giving them the benefit of the doubt to a certain extent that they are one of the 25 best programs um, in the country. But in terms of the things that have surprised us, again, um, Dabo did talk up this team. Everybody looks at the roster, and again, you do have kind of those Alabama-like expectations that it's okay. They brought in all these five stars, four stars. They're just reloading. Um, that it's just going to be different guys making the plays, and it, and it hasn't quite happened. I mean, what has been the most surprising, what would you say? Is it the lack of cohesion on the offensive line that that wasn't figured out coming into the year? Is it the uh, lack of a... Uh, you know, DJ Uyunglele making some of those easy throws, you know, kind of missing Will Shipley in the flat and, and can't run for 50 yards. I mean, what, is, what, what has been the most surprising thing, I guess, that you take away from those uh, deficiencies? I, I thought the offensive line in the interior, John, would struggle because it struggled all last season. And Dabo, Dabo bristled at times about questions about the O-line and the, you know, production in the running game kind of taking a dip in 2020. It certainly was exposed by a really good team, Ohio State, at the end of the year. And I didn't necessarily think they, A, I didn't think they got it fixed. B, I think it was a very much of a red flag that they had to flip Bach horse into that center spot late, relatively late in training camp. That was like, hey, we've got a guy playing out of position at center, and now that opens up a spot at guard where we're going to have somebody that's not as good as Matt Bach horse. So I thought the interior of the line would struggle, but that they could get by the Georgia game and win or lose the Georgia game that, you know, Georgia Tech, SC State, NC State, they could get by okay there. That hasn't happened. They clearly, and I've been saying this now um, to you and to others and writing about it, and I got to say, I said it right after the Georgia game, um, that they, they were late to the transfer portal train. They could have used a, an offensive lineman or two, a veteran running back, a slot receiver. It was yeah, I mean, if you just look at those holes, um, you know, if you like you said, able to keep Matt Bockhorst at left guard. If you have a, a nice center, you will bring in from somewhere else. You're able to get those yards after catch, uh, you know, plays from that Amari Rogers was able to give you. I mean, you could just basically flip flip it out to him on a screen, and he's going to pick up six yards. 
maybe 10, maybe 15, um, keeps you on schedule at least instead of a second and eight because you ran the ball and you can only get two yards or you flip it out there and you only get one yard. I mean, that's a huge difference. Um, but it, it's kind of uh, interesting now too, uh, the challenge gets harder um, because you know your best player on defense is out now. Brian Brzee, he tore his ACL, so he's gone for the year. Uh, you are, had already been without Tyler Davis um, and that was the, de- the defensive line in general is really stacked, but the defensive tackle position was the least stacked of the two. I mean, defensive end is where you're really overflowing with players. Um, and you're also now without Will Shipley for about a month uh, because of uh, because of a uh, leg injury, at kind of his knee. I think they said it's more like tibia, um, you know, area, shin area, right below the knee. That was hurt. They were, they were afraid maybe he had a torn ACL too. Um, and that area is really struggling because, you know, Lynn J. Dixon's already left and now it's down to kind of Kobe Pace and can Phil Moffa uh, be ready to play this year. But um, what, you know, is your level of concern about some of these losses? I mean, obviously, Rook Aroro has played well at tackle. Trey Williams has now steps up a notch. Um, what's the level of concern along the defensive line and that defense um, going into this game? My level of concern is medium to mid-level high, just because Boston College is a very physical team. The Clemson coaches and players have talked about that for several years. Those guys just see, seem to play them in a slugfest in the trenches. Uh, I think BC's strength is probably their offensive line, and that could be a matchup issue for Clemson if they have any other you know, weaknesses or problems or injuries along that defensive line line, um, which, you know, coming into the season was one of the best position units in the country. So um, it's it's interesting to talk about that. Now, you know, on the flip side, uh, losing Shipley is, is going to be interesting. I think Boston College's weakness is probably their front seven. And I think Clemson is going to be able to move the ball on them with or without Will Shipley. And John, for me, it's going to be interesting to see who steps up at running back as well as Will Shipley has played five touchdowns, 4.8 yards a carry, one touchdown run for all the other running backs combined, and that's Kobe Pace. It's going to be interesting to see if a guy like Mikey Dukes uh, from Charleston's First Baptist High School here um, gets a shot or not, and Lynn J. Dixon is gone. That running back depth was, I thought, a big concern going into the season, and uh I don't know exactly how they're going to work that, but it just puts more on Tony Elliott's plate and the legs of DJ Uyunglele. Yeah, and DJ Uyunglele, you know, hasn't been that consistent in terms of throwing the ball. He's missed some throws, some pretty, you know, I don't want to say they're easy because, you know, uh, I couldn't make them. But at the same time, it's you, you expect a, a college you know, quarterback to make and Um, But his running has been one of his best aspects in terms of when Clemson's offense is working. It's uh, because they're able to get DJ out and and pick up chunks. I mean, I think he had over 60 yards rushing in the last game. Um, You know, that seems to be an essential part of their offense right now is to to make sure that he's out there producing in some form or fashion. Um, Is that something that kind of has to continue, do we think, especially with the running back situation where it is? Uh, there's so many subplots here and games within the game, John, that they're going to unfold on Saturday night against Boston College and throughout the season. Yeah, you would like DJ Uyunglele to make plays with his legs and have some production there. But, wow, I'm, I was worried about Trevor Lawrence running a little too much just for the sake of injury concern. And I'm very worried about DJ Uyunglele because I'm not sure Clemson has a quarterback that can win an ACC game behind him at this point. And so it, his health is, is critical. And yet Clemson needs to keep those chains moving because uh, Clemson always good with uh, stats and things. And it goes back to, to Tim Beret, the greatest SID that I've ever been around. And I know you're going to have him on this program more later and you, you've had him already, but, and Ross Taylor and his crew do a great job too with that. But I think they had a stat that said, you know, Clemson in that defense holding teams out of the end zone uh, had gone 37 drives before NC state scored. Uh, I think it was late in the first quarter in Raleigh or 
something like that. But even a good defense like that eventually is going to get tired. And so at the end of the game, they give up back-to-back scores. And I know it's from 25 yards out in overtime, but still, you know, they did not hold. And I think fatigue was a key part of that. And that's something to keep an eye on going forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I asked it in the press conference going into the North Carolina State week if Dabo had any concerns about whether this defense could hold up if there was too much pressure on them, you know, week after week. And it kind of played itself out a little bit at North Carolina State. I mean, uh, North Carolina State had the ball for 42 minutes of a 60 minute football game. Um, that and That's only 18 minutes for Clemson. I mean, that is just asking way too much of your defense, especially when they have James Skalski on the sideline, Brian Brzee goes out, you're, you're working with less bodies as well. Uh, And you're asking those guys to play a ton of snaps. Um, The the offense has to be able to sustain drives. I I think what was the stat? I think it was eight straight drives with three or less plays. I think there was a kneel down going into halftime and an interception in there as well. So you didn't even have three and outs. You had even less than that a couple of times. That is going to be absolutely essential because this defense does have a breaking point as good as they are uh you can't lean on any defensive unit you know that much and it, it's going to be interesting to see you know can you know clemson a defensively mistakes too i mean they, they had offsides penalties last week they had a bunch of other things that prolong drives can they get boston college off the field the boston college team that can run the ball 275 yards on the ground last week um can they do that? And can Clemson stay on the field with drives? I, I guess that's the key to the whole game, right? Well, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think some of this is going to go back right into the lap of Tony Elliott. And just to kind of go, you know, back and forth and the yin and the yang on Tony, I mean, wow, he went from being a guy that had basically turned down a chance to interview at Tennessee and some other places in the off season and was the hot coordinator last year or one of them in the whole country. And I have great regard for him. I go back to seeing him play high school baseball in, in James Island here in Charleston. And I think he is now still one of the best coordinators and most valuable assistant coaches in college football. And you know what? He's paid like it. So there's lots of expectations there. Um, On the one hand, you can say, hey, that was easy. Being an offensive coordinator with Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence, yeah, (laughs) throw the ball down the field. Here's the play. That's that's a pretty easy gig. But I I would like to point out that Tony Elliott as an offensive coordinator at Clemson has won games with Cole Stout and Kelly Bryant and Chase Bryce, and I think he can do – pretty well with DJ Uyunglele, even in this kind of a season. But this is not leaning on your credentials of what you did in 2015, 2016, and 2018 against Nick Saban coach defenses, which Tony Elliott, I mean, I've asked Nick Saban about this, has the greatest respect for him. He's the best defensive mind made in college football history. So I don't think there's a problem with Tony Elliott. I think there's just a series of adjustments that are being made here. We talked about, you know, DJ struggling, being hesitant, the lack of depth at running game, the problems on the offensive line, receiver group hasn't stepped up. And oh yeah, the position group that Tony Elliott is brand new to after moving over from running backs, they love that tight end room coming into the season. They loved it. Where have those guys been? Where has Davis Allen and Galloway and, you know, Jason, La- where, where, where have those guys been? You know, that, that's one of the biggest puzzles, John, that I see. Yeah. I mean, one of the, the, the only play of Brady Galloway's that I remember this season was a drop that he had. It was a, it was a killer drop. And I think in the Georgia tech game, if I'm re- remembering correctly, uh, it's just, you gotta, you know, again, make the layups. I think Dabo Sweeney was saying that we have to make the layups and you have to catch a ball like that has to hit a guy like Will Shipley in the flat. I mean, you have to make the the easy plays. Um, There are running backs that aren't on the right track. Dabo saying that's happening as well. Obviously, offensive linemen missing, uh, you know, kind of calls and and who's keying on who in their zone blocking scheme. It's a uh, it's definitely a panoply of, you know, errors and frustrations. It's 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 all over the board. And I wonder Again, you talk about a series of adjustments. They came into that Georgia game. It seemed like they were going to try to throw their way out of it because they knew they couldn't run the ball. 
then they don't run the ball at all and really establish it. And they, they struggle there. Uh, and they try, you know, against Georgia Tech uh, to establish it more and they can't beat a three man front. <laughs> and so they're, they're passing into a, a team that's dropping eight. So it, it's a, it's a very um, perplexing. And I think, I think Tony Elliott's even called the, the situation weird in terms of how these first two games have went. They just haven't really been able to establish a rhythm. Uh, they haven't been able to really uh, do the things that, you know, they need to do. And I think Tony Elliott even admitted uh, we have to take more deep shots. You know, they might be covering us deep and trying to drop guys, uh, but we have to at least, you know, try to put it in there. Uh, but at the same time, when you look at the stats, DJ, I think I saw David Hale tweeted it out. Uh, he is three of 17, I think, on balls that are going. I don't know if it's more than uh, 20 or 30 yards. I forget what, what, the, what the stat exactly was, but deep balls. Basically, he's three of 17 this season on those throws. And that's that's hard uh, to, to go to that because if you if you call it up, it's first and 10, zero yards on an incompletion, you're in second and 10, and you're you're kind of trending towards another third long. So yeah, it's a it's a uh, whole mess of issues that is hard to kind of swallow again because you are Clemson that scored so many points for so long, and you have all these four and five star guys, you feel like you had the pick of the litter. Why can't you make it work? Uh, but maybe, you know, immaturity, I guess, is something you can't override, I guess, at the end of the day. Well, yeah. And um, I guess to summarize, like you said, Tony Elliott said it was weird and you said it's immaturity. Really, there's too much and so much newness. I mean, just you got a new guy, a guy just playing center. You have a new left guard. You have a new starting quarterback. You have a new slot receiver, a new lead running back. You have a new tight ends coach, Tony Elliott, first year coaching tight ends. You have a new, um, a new uh, guy who's only in his second year coaching wide receivers, Tyler Grisham, and you have a brand new running backs coach, CJ Spiller. That is a lot of newness on one side of the football. And um, hey, we knew all that in in August. And I and I don't not everybody no, not too many people thought Clemson was just going to pound Georgia. I think they thought it would be a close game either way. What's just been stunning is how they played against Georgia Tech, which I realized had a heck of a game against the Tar Heels last week, and NC State, and I fully realize that Raleigh is a tough place to play, but that's just not what you usually see from Clemson, which John, I was going to talk about this makes it interesting going forward here. Here's something I, I checked the Sagrin computer ratings, which I, I always have found to be Jeff Sagrin at USA Today does a really good job with that. And, um, you know, it's used in lots of prominent, you know, measuring things for playoff and polls and other things. But here's, if you use the, predictor number of the rating system that they have right now for all the teams. Here's the point spread for Clemson in every game the rest of the season. Boston College, Clemson by 16. That sounds really high to me, but Las Vegas, these polls know more than I do. At, at um, Syracuse, Clemson by 13. At Pittsburgh, Clemson by four. Florida State, Clemson by 22. Louisville, Clemson by 16. UConn, which is really struggling, has already fired their coach. Clemson by 45. Wake, Clemson by 10. At South Carolina, Clemson by 11. I mean, that just sounds rosy, rosy if you're a Clemson fan, but I'd be pretty surprised if that's the way those point spreads go the rest of the year. And I'm not being pessimistic. I'm just trying to be real. Yeah, I saw the Boston College one and the fact that it was in double digits, then beating them by double dig digits when Boston College is 4-0. They're coming off of a win in overtime. And uh, Clemson, like you said, um, why they're still ranked in the top 25, it's kind of puzzling because of the, the way they've played offensively, just so anemic and just so many mistakes. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, kind of what is a realistic expectation for what do you think, you know, how this game goes against Boston College? I mean, it, 14 points, 21 points. I mean, how many points do you think that, you know, they're actually realistically Clemson can put up and how realistic uh, is kind of, you know, what they can limit this offense to on the other side? Honestly, right now, John, I think uh, a win is progress at this point and anything in double digits is, you know, they're headed in the right direction because the, just the way they've played come out, especially the start they had against Georgia Tech, uh, I, I think you're just looking for a port in the storm here. And what that is for Clemson right now is just about any kind of victory. So uh, 
yeah, uh, especially considering the injuries. It's it's hard. I, can, I almost can't believe we're talking this way. And I and I again, I'm going to say what I said at the start of the show here. Um, I, I think Clemson's in really good shape for the future. I feel good about 2022 when I'm going to almost guarantee you, and I would bet as much as I bet, which is a dollar just for pride. There will be from one to five transfers that are really good players on that Clemson roster next year, and they'll be good. But right now, I don't think you can see that Clemson beating up on anybody left on the schedule, not Florida State, not, not Louisville. The only team you know that they will really pound is UConn, which is obviously – kind of out of their league and, you know, has already fired their coach. So other than that, I think everything's going to be require maximum effort for, for the Tigers the rest of the year. Yeah. I mean, and how much do you think this team can remain focused? I guess it's more of a psychological question, but, you know, obviously like a bail inspector or James Skalski and Nolan Turner, all these guys, they haven't experienced uh, losing like this. And they obviously came back for one last ride, hoping to go to the CFP. Um, do you feel pretty good about the makeup of this program and I guess the, this team that they're actually going to be able to, you know, keep up, you know, the level and the understanding that you are building for the future? Because again, like you talk about that 2022 roster, if you look about how much they have coming back, um, looks really good. I mean, it, it, you hate to say rebuilding year, but, uh, how do you feel like Clemson that is so not used to dealing with this type of scenario handles a quote unquote, you know, rebuilding year, or do you think they can move past that type of label and actually, you know, run the table and win the ACC and all that? I think they can uh, do it. And I think they have the character in that program to do it, but here's what I want to see: young leaders step up young players who are playing well and on position units that are playing well, or who are playing well themselves. What they don't need is older guys playing in position units right now that are not getting it done. I'm not going to name any names, but there's guys on position units not getting it done saying, rah, rah, guys, let's go. I'm your leader. Let, let's go. Dude, you're, you're, you're not doing it right now. Just be quiet. You know, I want to see younger guys having good seasons, stepping up, realizing that they are the future of this program going into 22 and 23. Yeah. And it's, um, an interesting thing that I remember from the press conference, it was, it was a smaller thing. Um, I don't know if it's a press conference. Actually, I think it was the call-in radio show for Dabo. He said that Davis Allen is a guy who's kind of emerged a little bit as a leader. You know, that's a junior in the tight end room. He'll be back. I mean, but you want more guys like that. I mean, younger guys. I mean, DJ obviously has to establish himself, but he has to play well to be able to establish himself as a leader of that offense. And um, What are some of those younger guys going to do to kind of take the reins of this program? Because, yeah, like we're saying, it's, it's um, it, it's it's not everything that Clemson fans have hoped this season was going to be. Probably it is not going to be at this point. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you know in the very near future and even into next year, uh, this program can't you know be back into that CFP type of conversation again. I know that I know I know that Paul Feinbaum said the Dabo dynasty is over or whatever, but you know people are going to say what they're going to say. Yeah, Paul's uh. He occasionally, believe it or not, tries to uh, get people uh, a little agitated, and that's, that's part of the thing. But I, I do think Clemson is in position to have a really interesting run to, to get to the ACC championship game. Uh, they don't control their path anymore with the loss to NC State, but it, it could be a, you, you always think there's a fun jumbled race in the ACC Coastal Division. There could be a fun jumbled race in the ACC Atlantic, and Clemson is good enough to win it. And hey, it would be a hell of a problem to have, John, if Clemson's celebrating a victory in the Orange Bowl saying, damn, we had a bad season this year. Yeah. And, and you know, that would probably be a, a pretty nice scenario for them, you know, be able to say, like, look where we were and look what we just did, you know, winning the Orange Bowl would be a nice little triumphant. Kind of story arc uh, for Clemson football. But yeah, first they got to do it. We'll see if it happens. Um, and so that's the show for this week. Uh, thanks, Gene, for coming on. And again, uh, just to let you guys know that the, the Tiger Take, our newsletter, if you want to subscribe to that, go to postandcourier.com forward slash the Tiger Take. I'll uh, send stories to your inbox and other interesting anecdotes and jokes and such things. So I uh, appreciate your guys' time and we'll see you next week.